Um, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. You're just going to have to use your imaginations. Um, so, excuse me. I, I started writing stories when I was about six or seven. Uh, obviously, I wasn't very good at writing them when I was six or seven. I could barely write. My handwriting was atrocious. Um, I was the same as any other kid. You know, when you're starting off and you're writing those letters, and every letter is like you're carving it out of stone. You're kind of, A! B! Um, Adventure, but I, I, I had a drive to write. I, I've, I've always had a drive to write stories and create stories. Um, and because all the stories that I read, they were, they were very short to start off. They were normally violent because I was a typical boy. Um, it was a high body count. They normally had some kind of monster in them, often an animal. Always explosions. Um, a typical story that I've written when I was about seven would go something like this. Once upon a time I went to school and there was an elephant in the yard. And a dinosaur came along and ate the elephant. And I fought the dinosaur and I won the end. Not a lot of character development. I hadn't really worked out my plot very well. Hadn't built up the suspense much. But that's how I started out. Um, and when I started writing, because all the books I read had pictures, because this is how we all start off reading this, um, I thought that stories had to come with pictures. I thought that was the deal. I thought writers drew. Um, and some of my favourite writers, like Dr. Seuss and Richard Scarry and Beatrix Potter, they drew their own lovely illustrations. So I thought that was the deal. I thought if you were going to write stories, you had to draw pictures, which was fine, because I like drawing too. Um, and I was one of those kids who made sound effects while he drew, uh, quite often without realising that I was making sound effects. I was in a little world of my own. Shane talked about flow earlier. I was all about flow. You can imagine a nice, quiet class, everybody working diligently away, and then you hear... <coughs> <laughs> that was me. Uh, any teachers here or parents who have got that kid, you, you'll know what it's like. Um, so I started off writing copybooks, and I would fill copybooks with stories and with drawings. It got to the point where I actually was buying, I was using copybooks that were supposed to be for school, and I was using them for stories, and my parents actually said, this is how strict they were, uh, you know, if you're going to keep using the, the books we buy for school for for fun, you're going to actually have to buy a few of them yourselves. Oh, jeez. Um, so sometimes, I didn't get a lot of pocket money, maybe enough for a Yorkie bar or something. So sometimes I had to choose a copybook or a Yorkie bar. And sometimes I chose the copybook. That's how sad I was. Uh, in my defense, choosing the copybook early on allowed me to buy many more chocolate bars later. <laughs> as you can see. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't listen to Paul, this is what you get. Um, so I, I started off using a copybook. I still sort of use a copybook. I have a, I have a notebook. Wherever I go, I have a notebook. Um, I, I, to the point where I actually buy clothes depending on my notebook. I will go into a shop, and most people, most people look for an item of clothing or a particular fabric or style. I will go in, I need a pocket that size with a pair of trousers attached to it. <laughs> and I'm not joking. My wife despairs. Um, she thinks I've been wearing the same pair of trousers for the last 20 years. Um, so I'm going to be following the script for some of this because I wanted to make sure that what I was going to say was as relevant particularly to um, creativity in the home as possible. <coughs> um, and like I said, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, but that's all right because we're going to, I'm going to project images into your minds. Um, so start off, when I started taking this stuff more seriously, when I, wanted to, I realized I wanted to be a writer, we, we were given a floor for some reason, just a little piece of one. I have no idea why. It's like we need to squeak right here. This one, this floor is fine. I don't know why we need an extra bit of floor. There's probably cables. <coughs> so, when I started taking this stuff more seriously, and I began thinking about how to do this job, I decided I would make my living as an illustrator until I could get published as a writer. And it takes a particular type of eejit to believe this. Um, because it's every bit as difficult to make a living out of illustration as it is out of writing. Uh, when I wrote my first book and I set out to get published, it was my firm intention to make a living from it, uh, so I could spend as much, as, my, as much time as possible writing and illustrating. I wanted to create so many books that by the time people figured out I wasn't a great writer, I'd be one. <laughs> and that way, I, what I lacked in quality, I could make up for in quantity. Now, I thought getting published would mean that I could just settle down, enjoy my newfound wealth, and spend my time writing and illustrating. I fully intended to be one of those reclusive authors who uh, basically lives out in a cabin in the woods, grows a long beard, runs around with a shotgun, telling people to get off his land. That was what I wanted. That was the dream. <coughs> with the millions I was going to make, I was just going to live out on my own. Didn't care. Didn't want to talk to people. 
And then I got published. Uh, and I went around trying to find my books in bookshops, as you do. Uh, and I couldn't find them. My books were hidden away in one corner in the wrong section, just with the spine showing. I'd written books for five to eight-year-olds uh, to start off, my first two books, and they had put them in the Irish published section with the Blasket Islands in the 1916 Rising. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> so that was when I found out that most published writers still have a full-time job doing something else. And I realised if I was ever going to make a living from writing, that I was going to have to do everything I could to let people know about my books. Nobody had told me about that when I sat there dreaming about being a best-selling author and living on my millions. I was going to have to go out and talk to people. Talk to people! I don't want to talk to people, that's why I write stuff down. The easiest PR sessions you get in Ireland are visits, well, for children's writers, are visits to schools and libraries, working with young children and doing storytelling, and in my case, a bit of drawing as well. But I had no experience dealing with kids. I didn't have my own at the time, and like many other writers, or unlike many other writers, I'd never been a teacher. But I found out I enjoyed it. Kids just want to be entertained, and if your story is rubbish, they'll soon let you know. <laughs> uh, sorry, what time are we finishing? Half past. Half past, right. Uh, so when I first started doing sessions for little kids, uh, I hadn't a clue how it worked. I, you know, I really didn't have an experience with little kids. So I would start reading them a story, and they would sit there, uh, and their faces would kind of droop and their heads would fall onto their arms like this. Or their head would actually loll around <laughs> and their eyes would glaze over. And I would think I was boring them senseless. Uh, and it took me a while to realize that this was a good sign, that their bodies could switch off as their brains gave themselves completely to a story. Can you remember the last time you were able to do that? Just everything left except the story. Just that in your head. Um, but I didn't get it. Well, I just saw the results. I was like, my God, I'm bombing here. They hate it. Um, and I would finish, and there'd be this still silence, them all just staring back up at me. <laughs> and I'd go, did you like that? And they'd go, oh yeah, it was brilliant. Because they didn't know that we need acknowledgement. They didn't know, it was like the opposite of adults. They, as far as they were concerned, yeah, job done, great. <laughs> uh, young kids also ask questions that adults would love to ask, if only they had the nerve. Uh, I remember one time I was finishing up a session and I asked, are there any questions? And one girl puts up her hand and she goes, can I go to the toilet? <laughs> Other classics include, do you know any famous writers? <laughs> Have you ever drawn any naked people? Uh, how much money do you make? I get that one everywhere. Uh, and then one of my personal favourite from a kid who cornered me in the school corridor, can I have your autograph? Who are you? My, my first school residency was with a class of seven and eight-year-old boys uh, in a deprived inner city area. Half the class struggled to read or write, while the other half was learning English as a second language. Uh, the teacher was a veteran campaigner, and she got me in because I could draw as well as write. Uh, I had no teaching experience, so this is a very steep learning curve for me. Never short of ambition, and because I didn't have a clue, um, I decided that they would each write, produce a ten-page illustrated story and we would not do any writing for the first five classes. Uh, some of them really struggled to write whole sentences, and if these lads could have spelled some of the swear words they used in class, I would have been very happy. Um, all the work was done by talking and using pictures at the start. Uh, and this was just as well, because it gave me a chance to explain that as this was going up in an exhibition in the children's section of the ILAC library, there were certain things we couldn't put in the pictures, <laughs> like stabbings, children smoking cigarettes, and unnecessary willies, um, I particularly remember one boy who, for reasons that weren't quite clear, drew a picture with a character whose penis was on fire. <laughs> and I was given the job of explaining to him that we couldn't put this picture up in public view in the library. And he was going, oh, come on, can you just have a smoking? <laughs> Broke my heart to restrain his imagination. But what I discovered, these kids were bursting to tell stories. They had a wonderful way with language, loads of imagination, and no inhibitions. And they had a kind of savvy that you wouldn't get from kids in a more protected environment. All they needed was the confidence. They had a real fear of failure. From very, very early on, they had this fear of failure. Um, and we gave, we gave them the confidence by making everything as easy as possible, to the point where a support teacher would write out what they said, and the, the child would copy out what the teacher had written down 
so that they would literally have to look at their own words written out before they could write them themselves. <coughs> um, uh, or sometimes I got them to shape, uh, trace the shape of a drawing. So they would trace the outline and the basic features, and then they would add details. So they, they got to feel like um, it would have the shape of a proper drawing, but they would put their own things into it. And this, got, you know, again, gave them confidence. They produced a good drawing with only doing half the work. Um, the stories were about monsters, so we didn't have a situation where somebody could say, oh, that's not what one of those looks like. It's only got seven legs. It should have 12. Um, we played and we cheated and we mollycoddled them until they each had produced a 10-page illustrated story. Although, granted, some of them only had two or three lines on a page and they showed me this new technique of putting large gaps between each word <laughs> to fill up space. I learned as much from those kids as they did from me and came away with firm conviction that's since been confirmed with other residencies that the stories that kids produce for themselves are earthier, nastier, and more honest and more action-filled than a lot of the stuff that the publishing market is producing for them. If you look at three of the biggest sellers for this age group, they're kind of eight plus, Captain Underpants, Ina Blyton Books, Howard Henry, they're very tame compared to what these kids would write for themselves. <coughs> I've been teaching writing and illustration for years to everyone from those young kids up to adults who want to do it for a living. Uh, and I've had to think a lot about what creativity is. What's it for? What do we need it for? And here's an attempt to explain that. I'm alone in my head. I can see that you're all out here in front of me, that, you know, that you're alive, you're blinking, there's fidgeting, moving, there's colour in your faces and you're breathing. Um, but when it comes right down to it, you're all just bodies to me. None of you can see all the stuff that's going on in my head, thoughts, all that stuff that's going on. There's a whole world in here you guys can't see. And it's the same for each one of you. Each one of us is a lonely mind trapped in a body, and there's only so many things, so many cues, so many ways of getting that out into the, uh, into the real world. Uh, and just as our brains have to conceptualize to make sense of the world, so we have this need to share our thoughts with other people, um, to better understand each other, to exercise the empathy that holds our society together, and this is why we write, why we write and why we draw, to impose order on the, core, the, the chaos of our thoughts. Um, to try and give it uh, a digestible shape. It's like speaking, but we can take more time. Um, we can think more about what we want to say. We can force those thoughts to behave by pinning them to the page and shaping them so that other people can take them in. Uh, give them some kind of recognizable shape so that they can be understood by others. It was stories that had the greatest effect on me when I was young and looking to be affected, so now I write stories, and I choose to write books. Uh, but if you choose to write something that must be read rather than listened to or watched, then your audience must apply their own skills. You can't just put pages of words in front of somebody and wait for that text to sink in. They must put the effort into reading your words and understanding them. I can only plant the seeds with those words. Those thoughts will lie dormant, sleeping, until somebody else wakes them up. They need somebody else's imagination to make them grow. So I must communicate clearly to make them understand what's in my head, and I must make those words appealing and entertaining so that others will want to read them. So yes, making myself up is my job. Uh, it's a difficult job to get into. I'd be the first to admit that I had some serious advantages growing up. We weren't very well off, but my parents were very progressive and well-educated. <coughs> Though they didn't spend a huge amount of time doing any art or writing with us, um, we were always read stories when we were young, from as far back as I remember. Um, and we also saw them reading regularly for their own pleasure. Uh, we also had music in the house, we had a piano, both my parents played. My dad played about six different instruments. Uh, my mother was a speech and language therapist. My dad was a psychologist who had done his PhD in creative behavior. A lot of the stuff Shane was talking about uh, this morning, I grew up with that. That was kind of our environment. Uh, he wrote extensively on advances in health, particularly promoting positive mental health. Um, books and art were part of our home environment. They were always around us. And it's such a basic thing. But, and here's where I have to quote some research. Uh, a 20-year study using data from 27 nations with over 70,000 cases says having books in the home has a greater influence on a child's level of education than the parent's income, nationality, or level of education. You think about that for a second. Not income, not where they live, not their own education. Books in the home have a bigger influence. That's massive. That's huge. 
and it's something we can actually act on. It's something we can do something about. It's never too early to introduce children to books. We know so much about a child's perception now. Cloth picture books are designed in black and white and in bold shapes and colours, specifically for the perception of a child under a year old. You can put books like that in the cot or the playpen long before you're even reading stories. And it's never too early to read them stories. They don't need to understand the words. They just want to hear their mum and dad's voice. Our five and seven-year-olds still expect a story every night before bed. Our 15-year-old, not so much. <laughs> Children will need vocabulary long before they start to read or write, and they'll pick most of it up from their parents and their older siblings. I produced some posters for a campaign to promote uh, positive mental health in babies and toddlers, which is going to be a big thing, It'll really push... Um, as again what Shane was talking about this morning the idea of positive mental health, mental wellness ahead of the problems rather than dealing with the problems when they come up uh, and it's funny how the simplest things we do have such fundamental effects so much of our language skills develop from the chatter we do, you know that thing you do as a parent when you're, you're telling them what you're doing as you're feeding or while you're changing their nappies or you're just chatting them while you're going around tidying up the kitchen this is essential stuff but not everybody does it or we forget to do it sometimes you know, we just do things quietly and don't talk to them while we're doing it. Um, touching them. Actually, t that was a weird one on the poster. On the poster, we had, one of the lines was, um, it was all, all the lines were, I love it when you. And one of the lines was, when you touch me. And we had to take that off the poster. And the picture I'd drawn was a dad blowing against the foot, like, <laughs> which I do with my kids, or well, used to do with them. Um, not so much with the 15-year-old. <laughs> We had to say, that one had to change to, I love it when you care for me. We weren't allowed to put, touch me. Um, playing with them, doing the dad thing of tossing them into the air while the mum tries not to watch. Uh, <laughs> all contribute to their coordination, but also to the sense of security, their confidence. And by the time they start formal schooling, they can already be well prepared in basic things like understanding the meaning of the words they will be learning to read, which is something we, we, kind of, we don't realise we have to compensate for and uh, prepare for. Um, being taught fingertip coordination, hand-to-eye coordination, so they can actually hold a crayon or a pencil when they start school. Again, it's something we, we, you do it, you, you give them these things, but we don't think about they actually need them before they start school. <laughs> um, one of the things that we're really bad at in Ireland is school libraries. We don't have them. And it's parents a lot of the time. I visit a lot of schools, and it's often parents who've worked with a particular teacher who just decided, they buy it to hell with it, we're going to make a library. Not some policy from government, not some kind of funding from the Department of Education. Parents and teachers decide they're going to find the money to put a library in their school. There's a lot of evidence that children shouldn't start formal classes of reading until the age of seven because too many of them find it difficult too early. Um, and again, if they've learned to fear failure when they hit that block, when they fail early with reading, it becomes like an enemy to them ever, if, from that point on. Um, it's too early... It's too difficult, and they say, right, that's, yeah, I'm not a reader. Look at that person, she's flying ahead. I'll never be able to read like her. Um, and when schools were originally told this, there was no real system to replace it. So they were told, you know, we, were, we knew that kids were being, some of the kids were being taught to read too early, but there wasn't anything to fill that gap. We, weren't, we didn't have a system to teach vocabulary without reading. Uh, my mother produced a program called Language World Literacy to support this. It's used in Louth and some parts of Meath. Um, I illustrated it. It's very good. Um, but teachers didn't... There was no systemic support for teachers to kind of compensate for this. Um, schools have already slipped back into old habits. My children started being ta uh, taught to read in junior infants. Uh, that's okay for my kids. They're growing up in a home full of books. Uh, many are not. And even those who are can still struggle early on. Our five-year-old is not going to be a vet like her sister uh, because she doesn't like studying. And that's because of the amount of homework she gets every night. She's five and she doesn't like studying. Uh, I'm against homework for young kids. I, don't, I think it's counterproductive, but I do think we need to support schooling. Um, I think one of the main ways we need to support schooling is to have school libraries so they can go into a, a library and pick a book that they like and take it home and read it with their parents. Um, but the benefits, I think, of early on, there's been a lot of research, there was a massive uh, collated uh, study of um, homework and the effects, and the benefits of homework were outweighed by the stress it caused. 
Um, certainly for junior and senior infants, I think homework is ridiculous. And they have, they, she is a good teacher. Our five-year-old is a very good teacher, but she's fitting in with the system that's there already. Uh, creativity, including the ability to read and imagine from someone else's words, is a, cre is a creative act. It starts with imaginative play. The ability to pretend something is real when it's not. Uh, it's crucial in developing theoretical thought. Our comprehension develops in stages. So first, you learn to recognize the cup because it's something you use. Then, you, you learn to pretend an empty cup has a drink in it. You learn to play. As you're doing this, you're learning that a picture of a cup can represent a real cup. And then eventually you will learn to read the word cup and know that it represents a cup. As this is happening, you also learn to play with words in speech. You rhyme, you make up words, uh, you make jokes using the words. Each step becomes increasingly theoretical. You start being able to form clear ideas in your head. If there's one thing I'm most grateful for in how I was raised, it's that my parents made me curious. I grew up asking questions, and they did their best to answer them. Uh, and this is long before Google. Uh, no matter half, how daft those questions were, they took them seriously. That was a really big thing. You know. um, <coughs> questions lead to answers, which provoke more, uh, provoke more questions, of course. Um, and it's a process that enriches your life. When I had my own kids, I made a decision early on that I would try to answer any question, even the difficult or weird ones, and even when I didn't really have time to be bothering with them. You know, so it'd be kind of, Dad, how many buckets of water would it take to put out the sun? And I'm going, I don't know, just get dressed, we're going in five minutes. Where are your shoes? So, I will still, I'll try, I'll try my best to answer any question. Um, and if I don't know the answer, I'll, I'll let them, well, you know, we'll look it up together, we'll go and check. Uh, but it is difficult, and some of our most entertaining conversations come from questions like this, but it can be hard when you're busy, um, and you're trying to do something, and your daughter comes and asks you, is it true that if you're born in an egg, you don't have a belly button? Uh, <laughs> right, hang on a second. <laughs> um, we have a lot of art materials in our house. Uh, and apart from the paint pots and the glitter, I hate glitter. <laughs> I hate it. I hate it in, in pots and I hate it on bloody dresses that leave a trail of glitter around the floor. Uh, but we keep, we keep our art stuff where our five and seven year old can get at them. Uh, so they can get stuck into something without having to ask. Uh, it's always there at their level. It's always ready to take out. Uh, that includes Lego, beads, craft stuff. Um, we got them toy uh, musical instruments whenever we could. Um, whenever we're out someplace, um, you know, my wife takes them to a football match, or yeah, it's the wife who does the football in our family. Uh, if, we're, if we're eating out somewhere or we're going somewhere, we, give, we bring coloring books, doodle books, activity books, sometimes even books you actually read. Um, and, but the main thing is that they are able to take out all their art stuff without having to ask. Um, they also have to put it away. Not quite managed to do that properly yet, but we're getting there. Uh, apart from any big expensive sets or extravagant pieces of equipment, art materials are the one thing we almost never say no to. Um, and to be honest, we don't actually have to buy them that often because we also, whenever relatives ask what do they want you know, for presents, art materials. Um, we'll find out whatever they're into or whatever they're using at the moment. And so we have a constant supply of them. It's great. Uh, <coughs> when I'm trying to answer one of the girls' questions, sometimes I'll draw something out that way using a pencil on paper or something they see as a normal kind of communication. Um, obviously I'm an illustrator um, you know, so I can do that kind of thing but you'd be surprised how many things you can draw or how many ideas you can get across with, with very basic drawing skills um, we have grown up learning a language of very basic visual symbols that you will all know but you don't realise that it's actually a language because we're not taught it formally in schools you know, we know what an emergency exit sign looks like you know what the, ma you know, the little man or woman on the door is for um, we, we have tons of these symbols um, but we don't think of them as a kind of a, a form of communication. <coughs> if you ever watch the Late Late Toy Show, you'll see the emphasis they put on toys that move and make a noise. Uh, it makes for good television, especially when they go wrong. Uh, it also makes for more expensive toys. And even as a kid, I wasn't very keen on that kind of stuff because it was so limited. Because if it was made to move, it made me less able to move it. Um, because it's motorized, you're kind of trying to make something move that it wants to do it itself. Um, it also could never make the range of noises my mouth and my imagination could make. Um, so it kind of limited what it could do by being made to do things. Uh, as a father, I find it increasingly difficult to buy a toy that doesn't need batteries. 
apart from the sheer material waste this creates and having to buy batteries, uh, it also adds the artificial noise in the house. And it means the child is more likely to sit and watch or listen to a toy rather than actually play with it and use their imagination. When something runs out of batteries in our house, I'll try and avoid replacing them. I am the stingy dad. <laughs> and we just quietly go, oh, the battery's gone, are they? Oh, yeah, we'll get those next week. Um, uh, but I also ask relatives not to buy toys with batteries in the first place. Uh, speaking of depriving one's children, <laughs> while I'd fully accept that they need lots of our attention as they're growing up, I'd also like to make the case for a bit of healthy neglect. Society has got into the habit of scheduling our children's lives, ensuring that they're never lacking in stimulation. However, I'm a great believer in boredom, uh, not just as a motivator, but also in allowing stillness and inactivity. Our brains are often overwhelmed with input, and something, it's something that's, apart from anything else, it's not, very, it's not helping our mental health. You know, I saw a great cartoon recently, um, my need to be well informed clashes with my need to stay sane. Um, we just we have too much access to information and it's driving us nuts uh, our seven-year-old is very intense uh, it makes her extremely well focused when she goes to do something but we've also had to teach her to go off and calm herself down when she gets too worked up she has to go off and find some space um, uh, when we're getting our kids ready in the morning we leave the radio off and this is hard both my wife and I like to listen to the radio but when we're getting ready in the morning get them out of school we don't turn the radio on because it's just one more thing to shout over um, it's just one more thing to add to the level of noise. <coughs> as parents, uh, we'll all have looked back on our own childhoods, as Shane did this morning, because our childhoods were better. <laughs> we had less, but we made more of it. <laughs> when we went out during the holidays, and for hours our parents wouldn't know where we were. I grew up in a building site in the last recession. Uh, we were almost a ghost estate. I don't know how many houses have to be empty for there to be a ghost estate, but we almost by uh, So I grew up climbing on construction equipment and in half-finished houses. Uh, my friends and I would pretend the holes for the foundations of the house were trenches from the First World War. Um, where there'd be puddles, like where a tractor or a digger had gone past, and there'd be pieces of wood in it that we'd use for ships, and we'd bomb them with stones. How cool were we? I say this to kids now, and they say, my, thank God I have a PlayStation. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Uh, on other days, we'd be, we'd be escaping from zombies in our flying JCB. <coughs> and this physical play informed my stories and my pictures, and it allowed my imagination to come out of my head and mix with my friends' imaginations. Um, it helped it all feel real. And if you think about how parents were back then, from the age of about nine or eight, nine or ten, my mother wouldn't know where I was. You know, she'd come out at the end of the day with a plate of food going, Oshin! Come home! I made food! Almost as if the smell was going to draw me back, you know? Uh, if we neglected our kids like that now, we'd have social services onto us. Uh, we've also become very concerned with dirt and germs, and, and we made our kids really conscious of sweat, which I think is a really bad idea for kids. You know, from a much younger age, we go, our, our uh, son was, he started like, asking about deodorants when I think he was 10 or 11. You think, what? Man up! What are you talking about? Deodorant. <laughs> Deodorant. Hey. Um, and we're more protective, more controlling of our kids than any generation before us, even though our world has never been cleaner or safer than it is now, and we're still more afraid for them. We teach them to be scared of strangers. That's nearly everybody. <laughs> if my child gets lost somewhere, say we're traveling and we happen to lose a child, which can happen. I don't want them to be worried about asking for help. I can't talk to this person. He's a stranger and he's foreign. <laughs> he won't even speak my language. Oh, my child is going to be wandering around, afraid to ask a policeman for help because he's a stranger. Um, and then, of course, there's school, where we train our children to sit down for hours on end, hardwiring them to think that staying in your seat is good, condemning them to battle with their slowly expanding arses for the rest of their lives. <laughs> And we make the mistake of telling them that reading is good for them, like vegetables and fish. <laughs> While we use television and games as the real reward for doing as they're told. Imagine yourself as the average kid who isn't opposed to reading. Uh, even with all the other distractions, when you're young, you know you should be reading. Most of us with the highest status in society have good educations and you want to be among them. 
But there's no such thing as passive reading. You have to put, into e put in the effort to get results, and it take a while before you're able to take in those exciting stories on your own, before your imagination can transform those words into images and ideas. And there's one thing being able to decipher words and understand what they mean, and another where you can actually leap, make the imaginative leap, and it becomes a film in your head. They are two different things. <coughs> As an entertainment, it's hobbled at the start of the race. But you persevere because you think you need it for school and for work and, you know, that the stuff in there that you like. And as you're being handed books, you see magazines lying around that the adults are reading. Uh, sometimes that's all you see them reading. And you know they're not for you, which is half the reason you want them. Uh, and you have access to all sorts of things online now, and you know it's not as regulated as the stuff the teachers can use in school. Um, so once children become independent readers, instead of ensuring that they have a constant supply of reading material that they love, that will inspire a passion of reading, we often imply to kids at around kind of 8 to 12 um, that they must keep advancing. You know when they hit that one series that they simply will not read anything else. And they need to plateau and find it comfortable and get used to reading. But um, we keep implying that, no, no, you've got to read the classics. Um, you have to read more challenging stuff. Um, and we accidentally are teaching them that the aim is to end up reading stuff you don't enjoy, which is not a great motivator. I don't have definitive answers for what appears to be the biggest problem facing educators in the book industry, how to get kids to read more and read better. Uh, I do believe that games, television and films are not the enemies of reading, as they're often so portrayed. Um, they're feeding a need that's out there, and one that's patently not being fed enough by books. Uh, I think part of the blame, paradoxically, lies in a lifestyle where young, ch young children are not encouraged to explore and get dirty and take risks. They're safer in front of the telly or playing a console game. They're not burning off that fidgety energy churning up inside them. They're not being left outside to find their own entertainment and let their imaginations run riot. There was a time when a kid's party used to consist of just filling, consist of just filling them with sugar and letting them out in the garden. Um, now we're expected to provide entertainment. There's a real social pressure among parents for this. Every time we stump up for a magician or a bouncy castle, we deprive our kids of something. We're not giving them something, we're taking it away. We are taking away the will to use their own initiative. I think the children, and boys at primary school level in particular, need to spend much less time sitting at desks and more time applying what they learn in lessons to practical tasks where they can use their hands and move around more. They need to be problem solving, building things, maybe even things they read about in stories. Ireland and the UK have a real lack of playgrounds and sporting facilities for kids, but that is improving. And we could be using them to associate reading, writing and art with play. We could have a whole pages of local sporting news displayed on notice boards at a 10-year-old eye level, in libraries, in communal sports grounds and on the bare walls of sports clubs for them to read while they're waiting for their friends to get changed or their parents to pick them up. We could have the alphabet and words painted around every playground, not just in schools, but everywhere. Fairy tales and nursery rhymes on billboards. We could have interesting trivia or the instructions for playground games. You remember those? On easy-to-read illustrated signs, we could commission intelligent graffiti. We could ensure that not every piece of attractive typography on the display around or near our schools and libraries is a piece of advertising. And again, I come back to school libraries and the importance of those to make the passion of reading important. Uh, the JCSP libraries, for anybody who knows them or hasn't heard of them uh, in secondary schools, are trying to compensate for this. They're trying to bring back the idea of a place for books being a place that's fun and a comfortable, easy place to relax. Um, but they're only in underfunded, or sorry, only in disadvantaged areas, as if they're only for problem kids. There's one thought I want to leave you with, and it's this. Any suggestion that creativity is something that some people have and others don't is utter nonsense. It simply isn't true. We put far too much weight on the word talent, believing that art is created by special people in the thrall of the muse. Creativity is not some vague, ethereal thing only experienced by oddballs and alternative thinkers and flighty prima donnas. It is quite simply the skills description of what's in your head, in which we attempt to make emotionally compelling so that somebody else will take it into their heads. It is a skill that's essential to communication. It's one that we all have to some degree. And it can be taught and practiced and learned. And for the good of society and for the love of all that's beautiful and fun, we should encourage it in children. So I'm going to draw you a picture now. I think we have a few minutes left. Okay. Uh, now, normally I draw with a pencil to start.
show the screw rejects because I think they don't show it on telly, and they make it take the load. <coughs> so do you guys are going to be blocking your way to the way. <laughs> but you just have to do it. Um, always start off <coughs> with a bit of a scribble. And I like the kids seeing the scribbles. Um, I like that it's not perfect when it starts off. And the idea being that, uh, yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I project well enough. <laughs> <laughs> My wife says it does. So, and at this point, I'll have this bit drawn, and I'll say to kids, can you see what it is? And they kind of go, yeah, we can get a robot or something. And I go, um, I already know some really important things about this drawing. I know what size it is, I know what shape it is, and I know where it is on the page. This is called composition. And before I add any details, this is the most important part. So that part where you see the kid drawing a head, and a great neck and shoulders and chest and arms and a tummy and legs and they're getting a lot of them and they have feet. <laughs> That's because they do this bit because somebody on television is often going to draw one piece at a time. So <coughs> instead we work out very roughly and we draw lightly all the time. then into either a dip pen or a brush with ink or paint it. Um, before even that, I was doing a thumbnail drawing, a tiny one, just to work out the composition, the position of everything. Um, but first, I'm just going to put all the main bits in it. Because I'm working with the marker, I don't want to get too heavy. Um, but you can see that it's not, it's not perfect at the start. The really important part of any kind of art is failure then you're making mistakes and then learning from the mistakes. And again, if you, if you try and get it perfect, because most kids, when they see illustrations in books, they want to think, they think they're perfect at the start. Uh, it took me years to find out that the illustrator did this scribbling. Um, so there's enough there, normally with a pencil, I'll go a little bit more into detail. Um, <coughs> There's almost enough now that I can go with my heavy marker, as you said. Maybe you guys at the back should be able to see enough of that. So now I'm going to use. Now I'm going to use a heavy marker. Let me get it clearer. Uh, I never use markers for finished illustrations, it's just a big and a quick for the drawing. As I said, for a finished illustration, I'll use a brush, or a dip pen, or a pen, if you get the bottom of it. Or, since I'll use a, what's called an isograph, which is kind of a technical drawing thing, I feel like drawing with a needle. But notice that the drawing doesn't really come to life until you put it in the eyes. And one of the things about getting kids to draw is that you don't have to be a brilliant drawer yourself. Certainly a simple shape you can learn to draw very quickly, but also you can, they can trace over things to get them started. To learn proportions, to learn the positions of things. You can get them, and there's, there's loads of doodle books now. Um, you have to wait to see if they actually, you know, later on in the years when the doodle books actually have a positive effect or not. But they're a good way to get kids started because they'll have half the drawing done and the kid gets to draw the other half. Um, and I think that can be good for their confidence, that they feel they get a good looking picture. And they've only had to do half the work, you know, to have kind of a help along the way. There's my granddad. And then quite often I talk about my granddad. So my granddad came from a bunch of old men that I knew. Um, one of them was big square glasses, another one was bald, and another one was slowly sinking into his trousers. <laughs> um, and uh, people often ask where did you come from? Well, the idea was that the child can't go out on their own. 
you know, they can't get on the bus and go somewhere on the road. So I want the kids to be able to travel and move around. And so I think the responsible adults, they can't get into trouble. That's what the responsible adults are for, to keep them out of trouble. So I thought, well, what if you'd be an irresponsible adult? Um, and when you do that with parents, it's a little bit creepy. Um, but a mad grandad, but you know, grandparents are a little bit mad anyway. You know, you think about the kids, they're almost like from another planet. Uh, from a different world, so um, well, well, yeah, that's it. My brother, little bit dotty, not scary dotty. Uh, and Terry, because I often wonder why cartoon characters are not. You know, just you know, as well, just then you get old, you do get hairy. Disappears off the top of your head and starts coming out in other places. <laughs> I've often wondered why men use the hair on the top of their head first. You know, hair on the sides, always the top where you need it, uh, for its function. Shiny, just put a little bit of a highlight on the top there, put the dog white, put the rest in the dark. And any, any aspect of drawing can be broken down into simple steps. So, this is the grass and the bush behind you. There are so many good books on teaching steps drawing, but the main thing is that it is a practical skill, skill that we can, that can be learned. Around the age of about eight, nine, ten, they start thinking, oh, I'm not a <coughs> I can't draw. All they need is enough of the simple steps to show that anybody can do this stuff. I was never the best artist in my class. Never even in primary, secondary, or in art. 